Welcome to the Shift to Hospital at Home, a program that Matter is producing together with the company Dina. I'm Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter. We are a healthcare technology incubator, an innovation hub built on a belief that collaboration between entrepreneurs and industry leaders is the best way to develop healthcare solutions. At our programs, we like to explore topics at the intersection of healthcare transformation and entrepreneurship. And today, we are delighted to focus on the shift to hospital at home. We continue to see more health systems and more payers exploring new models of care delivery, including hospital at home, especially as value-based care becomes more prevalent. But we also see many organizations struggling to successfully operationalize hospital at home and prepare their teams for such care delivery innovations. We co-produced today's program with one of Matter's member companies, Dina, which helps hospitals and health plans coordinate care for seniors by improving visibility and real-time collaboration with post-acute and in-home care. And they have been working very closely with HealthLink advisors. Uh, and I'd like to welcome four individuals now who bring tremendous depth of knowledge to this subject. Ashish Shah is the CEO of Dina. He leads the team on its mission to power the healthcare industry's transition to virtual and in-home care. Ashish founded Dina in 2015 and is passionate about empowering care teams with the tools they need to help people age in place. He previously served as the CTO of Medicity, which was the market leader for vendor, vendor neutral uh, healthcare HIE solutions. Uh, it was one of the early success stories in healthcare IT. They were acquired by Aetna in 2011. Dr. Marianne Laletta serves as Dina's chief medical officer. She previously served as medical director for Inspira Health's Medicare Pace Life program, a full risk-bearing model providing all-inclusive care for the elderly, as well as, uh, as an ACO physician champion for the Inspira network. Um, in her PACE Life role, she guided a 150-person care team who's responsible for delivering high-quality, low-cost coordinated care, often in the home, to approximately 300 seniors in the New Jersey area. Cynthia Davis is a clinical transformation executive at HealthLink Advisors. She has more than 35 years' experience in healthcare information technology and healthcare operational management. She's led and supported healthcare IT and operations in all types of health systems across acute care practices and post-acute care venues. And Tina Burbine is HealthLink Advisors Vice President of Care Innovation with over 25 years of population health and healthcare IT experience. Over her career, Tina's focused on shaping the strategic approach for, approach for health systems moving to value-based care, enabling teams to focus on keeping their patients healthy addressing rising risk and improving the health of those with chronic conditions. Thank you all for joining us today. With that, Ashish, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephen, for that warm welcome and introduction. And uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here today to discuss such an important topic in terms of the shift to hospital at home. Um, matter, their members, their partners, the entire community have been incredible partners on our journey over the last six years. And we're excited today to be joined by our partners at HealthLink Advisors as we dive deep into this topic. Um, today, our goals uh, are really at a high level to define what are, care, what are all of these different care at home models. You can't wake up without a new model being launched either whether it's through the centers of Medicare and Medicaid uh, or other commercial programs that are being launched. And so we want to define what hospital at home is today, outline why hospital at home matters to you and your organization, discuss the different steps that you can incrementally take to deliver on a model like that, and then re review key areas, um, and then make room for question and answers, uh, a question and, answer, question and answer session today. Um, to get us started, uh, I wanted to pull in Dr. Marianne Laletta from the DINA team, our chief medical officer. And, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion, rightfully so, in the industry around virtual and in-home care. But I, I have a question for you to kick the conversation off is, is hospital at home or these new care at home models really similar 
um, to something that's been around for quite some time, and that's home health or home care. I'd love for you to share with the audience um, what may be similar or different about these models. Sure. I mean, I think there's a lot of different terminology being thrown out there. Um, there is the strict CMS acute hospital care at home waiver definition of what hospital at home is. But then there are some other innovative programs out there where hospitals or health systems are partnering with payers. And those definitions of hospital at home may vary slightly from the CMS waiver definition. In addition, you hear sniff at home. So just a lot of uh, different terms and a lot of confusion. Today, we'll be focusing more on the CMS acute hospital care at home waiver. And I will have a slide shortly to really explain that more in detail. But we have to remember for hospital at home, these patients would have been inpatients if these programs were not offered. So I think that's very important to realize. These are sick patients that would have qualified for an inpatient stay if you didn't offer the other service. Home health varies uh, a lot from hospital at home or SNF at home. Um, if you want to look at the SNF at home model in particular, you know uh, what you need is the basic structure of what home health can deliver plus a lot more. The ability to do daily skilled nursing visits perhaps daily PTOT or speech therapy, if that is what is required of the patient, meal delivery, coordinate non-emergent medical transport, education of the family and or caregiver involved, medication management, care coordination services. So it's, it's a really very much buffed up version of what we might consider home health. I mean, really, again, it's called sniff at home. So it should be the services that a patient would have received in a skilled nursing facility brick and mortar um, without you know, this uh, new program model being put in place. Got it. So home health is something that's been around for quite some time, really an extension of something that could have happened post-hospitalization and or even after a primary care visit like physical therapy or occupational therapy or some level of skilled nursing. But hospital at home, is one of many models that are out there for using the home as a care setting for something that would have happened in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility, perhaps even an outpatient, uh, outpatient ambulatory center of some sort. So I, I think I'm getting it at a high level. You know, where I want to take the discussion next is, you know, Dr. Loletta, if you can, you know, hospital at home sounds, there seems to be a lot involved there. But if, if I'm typically going to be admitted into a facility and have a four to seven day stay inside of a hospital, there's a lot that happens. What does it actually take to replicate or exceed that type of experience in the actual home? So again, uh, patient selection, these patients would have to qualify for an inpatient hospital stay. So you need some sort of leveling process, right? Whether that's through MCG, Interqual, whatever you use for your hospital system to decide who's appropriate for inpatient care. Um, there is a requirement that the patient must be examined by a physician or advanced practice uh, provider in person prior to being admitted to the program. And that uh, admitting provider must write the HNP and admitting orders. Uh, patients must opt into the program, uh, agree to it. Um, and you know you see a whole host of a list on the right side of the screen, and I'm sure Cynthia will jump in at any moment uh, with her nursing background. But uh, you know daily physician or advanced practice provider evaluation; uh, those may be remote or telehealth or in person. Two sets of daily vital signs obtained daily in person uh, by a clinician, clinical team member could be RN, um, or if that facility works with mobile integrated health paramedics. Uh, remote monitoring must be consistent with um, the existing policies and standards of care. So, you know, it can be continuous or it can be intermittent. Uh, care pathways, uh, you must be able to provide diagnostics in the home, x-ray, uh, possibly ultrasound, laboratory with quick turnaround times for results, um, potential hospital trip if there's a need for a um, further or uh, more extended tests than you're able to perform in the home, and then uh, discharge planning. Uh, Cynthia, do you want to add to that? Certainly. And I think when we think about hospital at home, it really is an approach to help us provide the right care in the right location. I think very specifically of an example from a patient care process in a large IDN we uh, worked with recently. They had uh, a large problem with too many uh, readmissions. They were 
on the road to get huge penalties from CMS. And there was a use case in which a gentleman had had, with very complex care delivery needs, had been uh, readmitted to the hospital eight times in five months. He was then enrolled in the hospital at home where he got hospital level care at his home and uh, didn't and no longer has had any readmissions in the last four months. So it really is about making sure you uh, provide those things that we've outlined on this slide and making sure that it's uh, uh, provided in a way that's high quality and safe. And frankly, there's such a high level of satisfaction on that front as well. We know what the evidence is telling us that these types of programs uh, reduce fall risk, they reduce readmissions, they are highly satisfying and they help increase the mobility for, uh, for patients who have chronic, chronic illness. Thank you, Marianne. Um. Cynthia and Dr. Dr. Lillette, wonderful comments there. I think I'm starting to understand, you know, there's a, a lot of different things that can happen in the home. There seems to be a lot here that's involved with hospital at home, in particular as a delivery model. Tina, I wanted to pull you into the discussion. I know that HealthLink Advisors, as, as it was mentioned in the introduction, works with a number of health systems and health plans to help them outline a blueprint on how to actually make sense of all of this stuff. There, there must be some level of common attributes to things that systems or plans are already doing today that can almost serve as a foundation. I'd love to bring you into the discussion and sort of get your perspective. What are you hearing as you work with your clients in terms of why does this matter today? Yeah, thanks, Ashish. You know, our healthcare market has changed drastically in the past year, and it's enabled many care at home services to be viable care pathways now. So we have you know, the CMS announcement um, of that reimbursement model for acute hospital at home that Marianne and Cynthia described, you know, was brought into the market in November of last year. And there's been the influence of the payers who have quickly also recognized the benefits of this type of care and are willing to participate in the new reimbursement models also. So care at home approach impacts an organization's value-based care models um, meaning that as the volume of patients who experience those improved outcomes that Cynthia just described, you know, also improve their overall performance in parallel. And so while some health systems um, may have started their journey to hospital at home to help address bed capacity strains during the COVID spikes, we know that hospital at home services are intended to treat a broad variety of conditions. So when we think about um, those variables and the combination of today's consumer-based driven healthcare market, you know, patients prefer to be in their homes and many are beginning to request it. So all of these factors are converging to create an opportunity for health systems and payers to establish their long-term sustainable hospital home programs. It seems like Tina, that there's an opportunity to almost establish a leadership position in, if, in your market that you may serve here. And it's only a matter of time before this is a realistic option for many who prefer this and can actually safely receive or exceed the experience that you receive in a facility. Um, is, this, is this entirely new or has it been around for some time and, and where is this actually taking place today? Yeah, globally, this is a standard of care that's been in place for years and it's considered the norm outside of the US. In fact, many of the EHRs that we're familiar with here support hospital at home workflows in these international markets. Um, so it's only in the US where hospital at home is not mainstream, but we're on the brink of this becoming a standard of care here. And it's very exciting. You know, we have 71 health systems across 33 states that are currently approved for hospital at home reimbursement with CMS and many more are considering to enter that approval process. In addition to that, we also know that they're beginning to partner with their payers more closely um, to support their value-based care positions as well. This is, this is fantastic. I mean, it, now in healthcare, we're always trying to do the right thing for the patient, right? I mean, that, this ultimately has to deliver the right level of care in the right setting that, that doesn't actually um, create reduced or lower outcomes than what you would expect in the facility. So let's assume that that's in place um, I know that from my, my work in the market, and I'm sure similar to yours, that finances or the money of this often comes up. And, you know, can you talk to our audience a little bit about 
the economics of a program like this? I mean, are we looking at potential revenue attrition? How does an organization actually think about getting prepared and either getting this finance paid for in a way that doesn't actually damage the organizations that are delivering this level of care? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that there is data out there, multiple studies have been done that do show, you know, with a reduction in total cost of care, um, averages as high as 40% compared to inpatient, inpatient bed care. And so as we remember, you know, that um, those research studies, you know, and place that in parallel to hospital at home, um, providing the ability for organizations to mature and be ready for value-based care, a health system is going to improve their perform performance overall with a reduction in length of stays, lower readmission rates, avoidable ED visits, lower SNF admissions. And so it's with the variety of payment models that now exist, it's absolutely possible to establish a financially sustainable program and model and so for those health system leaders that have joined us today, you know, take note that the payers understand that this type of care drives down cost, and it's why they're entering the market themselves. So this means that new market competition between payers and health systems um, exist now and will continue to, to garner in, in pressure over the next few years as patients seek out hospital at home care um, they're looking for that from their neighborhood health system. And if they aren't able to find it, they will turn to member plans that may provide it um, as well. So I, th I think I'm starting to get a sense of, you know, what are the various care at home models out there? What is hospital at home? Um, how do we potentially finance a new care delivery model where we, we're using individuals' living rooms as a care setting? I mean, that, that's a pretty radical idea in many in many cases, but it's, we're starting to see, and as you mentioned, globally, this has been around for some time already. So, um, you know, Dr. Lillette, I wanted to pull you back into the discussion for a moment. I know that you know, during the introduction, we talked about your role as the executive director and position a champion for a PACE program. So maybe you could take a moment to talk about um, what PACE is, and then you know, throughout COVID over the last 18 months, I know that your delivery model had to change radically to one that was facility-based, to one that was in-home. I'd like to start to transition to the discussion to what does an organization need to do to get ready for a transformation like this? Sure. And I just want to add, um, also in my uh, career past, I served as VP of medical operations for a health system. So not only was I medical director for PACE and you know the provider and the um, insurance company, I also was responsible for creating new medical uh, delivery programs from the hospital. And so, you know, being able to see that from like a 10,000 foot view and combine all those different perspectives has really given me a lot of insight. Um, many of you may be familiar with PACE, but some may not be. So PACE stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. It's funded by CMS. Um, it is a fully at-risk program. It is not available in every state. In order to qualify for PACE, which is called LIFE in some states, which stands for Living Independently for Elders, you must be 55 or older and live in the catchment area of the program. It's limited to certain zip codes that that program is approved to provide care within. You must qualify by your state for nursing home level of care, but desire to live independently on your home, and the program has to be able to deliver that care safely for you. So there's an evaluation process to make sure that the program can meet your needs. Um, I won't get too much into the finances of it, but majority of the patients are Medicare really eligible uh, for it. Very few self-pay patients enter into the program, but it is a program that is responsible 24 seven for the care of the patient. And again, you serve as the insurer and the provider. So you're on both ends. You really have aligned goals to keep these patients healthy, safe at home, uh, low cost, high quality. During the pandemic, uh, we had to shift from mostly in-clinic care to pretty much virtually 100% in-home care. Um, many of our patients, they're elderly, they're frail, they were very fearful of COVID. They did not want to enter the hospital. They did not want to go to a SNF after a hospital stay if that was being recommended. So we had to rapidly adopt new care delivery models, including remote patient monitoring, telehealth, 
um, and, and really change the mindset of our entire team from being a brick and mortar based clinic provider to on the road provider. There are many challenges there. Um, you know, even though we rapidly adopted technology and gave all of our staff iPads, you know, some simple things came up like I can't document in the patient's home because there's no Wi-Fi. So we had to get MiFi's and have mobile hotspots traveling around with our uh, staff so that they can, you know, get their work done and not have to drive 15 minutes down the road to get a connection and waste time. Uh, you know, you have to look at your geographic distribution, your patients. Not every patient uh, were we able to provide those high-level care uh, delivery in the home. You really have to look at what's the home environment like, what um, is the home support system like, are there caregivers available to assist, uh, medication management is a challenge, uh, it's doable, and I, I'm kind of almost glad that the pandemic forced us to flip on a dime because I think we would have dragged our feet for, mo feet for months um, if we weren't forced to do it. So, you know, uh, what did they say? Uh, it, um, necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, it, it created us uh, a situa situation where we had to just get it done. There was no option. Yeah, I mean, kudos to you and the team. I mean, it, it, I know that there was a lot of intensity in operating in the last 18 months, but it sounds like your organization was able to figure it out on the fly. You know, I, I wanted to pull Cynthia, you into the discussion and, and tap into your operational experience here. You know, over the life of your career, you've, you've led a lot of significant transformation. And, you know, as I think about what Mayor, Dr. Laletta just described, um, there must be some sort of framework or process that we can start to think through or adopt that allows us to not have to reinvent the wheel on the fly, but do this in a more standardized and accelerated model. Maybe you could take a few moments, Cynthia, to, to talk to that. Absolutely. Um, I think, first of all, we've all had a long uh, history of implementing clinical and financial information systems over the last, frankly, decades, uh, supported by our meaningful use dollars, both in the practice setting as well as in the acute care setting. But we're still, in a, a number of organizations, very siloed when we think about our care transition approach. And this really is, as I said earlier, about providing the right care in the right location. So what I propose here is really looking at um, your strategy for how you want to deliver this uh, very innovative care. Starting off, of course, with making sure that you've got a core leadership team, executive level leadership, creating a vision, um, and you know, really taking a look at your culture for innovation, and then aligning the care delivery teams. I think of a recent client um, I worked with who I uh, had, frankly, 150 meetings a month for care management. Uh, the home health agency had a care management meeting, the ACO, uh, the hospital, the practice, but yet they weren't miss meeting their targets. And frankly, gathering the team together and really getting the right care innovation structure um, is a key enabler for the, the framework of success. And then, frankly, uh, take, beginning to take a look, how are you going to prove it? provide this care? How and, you know, what's what's going to be your staffing model? What sort of clinical protocols are you going to have in place? Uh, preparing that all, all for success. And then frankly, going ahead and launching. Some of the most, the heaviest lifting is really taking a look at all your very detailed workflows. How are you going to deploy IV medications? Are you going to use nurses or paramedics? Are you, um, you know, you're, you need 24 seven monitoring. What's your physician and your medical control process? And then frankly, also taking a look at your payer relationships. Do you have a strong managed care environment in which you might partner with a third party payer? As Tina spoke about earlier, many of those uh, payers are beginning to uh, get into that marketplace. Do you wanna retain that revenue or do you wanna share it with your payer? What's your, what's your all overall strategy? Uh, Marianne, uh, any additional items? Yeah, I mean, when I look at this slide, I really um, agree with all the points on it. When you look at the vision and mission, I would say a line around patient stories. And I'll give you a story right now. I had a family member, great aunt, married greater than 60 years, moderate dementia, who may not be someone that you would typically think that you would enroll in a hospital at home program. She did not have hospital at home available to her. Ended up in the hospital. 
her way of dealing with her anxiety, which she had at a baseline before her dementia progressed, was to walk. She walked for miles every day, and her trusty husband walked alongside of her. Uh, when she went into the hospital, she was not allowed to walk. Uh, they were limiting her to her bed. She eventually ended up in restraints. Um, medications, which worsened her confusion, fell, had a hip fracture, needed surgery, ended up then in a skilled nursing facility, had complications and passed. Um, you know, I, I still ache over that story because I believe if she had something available to her like hospital at home where her husband could have been there at her side and her children and grandchildren who are nurses really would have just pulled around her and been able to support her, allowed her to have the mobility that she would have needed that could have avoided that consequence from happening. So I, I think you need to align around patient stories. I agree with the enterprise care team structure, know your people. Uh, are you in silos or do you communicate effectively? Know your processes, policies, and technology. Uh, you know, we don't always talk about it a lot, but there are a lot of gaps. You need a lot of players involved here, and often they're on all different platforms, and those platforms don't communicate, but you need that information. So you really need to think about and be honest, you know, what you can do on your own and where you may need to bring in others or additional resources or technology. Dr. Lola, I appreciate you sharing your comments there. And Cynthia, for introducing this framework, I think this was incredibly helpful for many as they think through just this, again, this, this transformation. Tina, I, I wanted to pull you back into the discussion here for a moment and kind of zoom in on partners. You know, oftentimes, I think at least in my discussions, um, the natural tug in this discussion right now is, can I do this all by, by myself or do I need to partner with somebody else? What's the go-to-market approach for introducing this service? And, you know, and, and what's the approach on day one versus when it's fully operating and scaling at some point? Um, what's been your experience in your discussions with your, your health system and health plan partners? We see, thanks Ashish, we see that partners are key to building an effective hospital at home program. So if you step back and you think about all of the services that a patient in an inpatient bed setting receives in just a 24 hour period, it's those same types of services that need to be replicated within a patient's home for them. And that's a long list, right? That includes pharmacy, respiratory care, labs, you know, of course, remote patient monitoring, medical supplies, DME, you know, occupation speech therapy, maybe, medication delivery, home infusion, diagnostics, uh, radiology, and nutrition. And so it's so critical to, to identify how those needs are going to be met and to leverage partners that are going to automate that supply chain as much as possible. So there's, there's a lot here. There's a lot of partners, and I'm sure that some organizations may own some of these, but it sounds like there's really a focus here on perhaps identifying the right local partners who can meet your standards for delivery. You're just, just building on this conversation a little bit more Partners is one thing. I think Dr. Loletta also made mention of workflow and technology. And, you know, I'd love um, to just, again, ask you a follow-up question here. What role do EMRs and other existing technology uh, investments play in this? I mean, clearly over the last 20 years has been a heavy investment in healthcare technology. What can you use and where may you need to look for, for new sort of uh, tools? Oh. I think you're on mute. One of the things that we really help our clients understand is that, you know, as the EHR vendors have entered into this market and they're striving to keep up with the industry change by providing uh, health systems with a small basic package of workflows, but those workflows are very limited and it leaves large hospital at home program technology gaps that need to be addressed. And so those gaps include uh, a, a wide variety of things, like how are you going to identify the patients that your teams are going to work with and enroll in hospital at home? You know, how is that registration process going to work? Scheduling, dispensing and routing their medications, the imaging and lab needs that are all, uh, you know, and all other outpatient orders that they may need in their home as well. You know, the EHR hospital at home workflows, they're created from an inpatient build, but that also means that any non-DRG code services require manual intervention. So that impacts the program's revenue cycle if a manual charge entry is not entered to capture all of the appropriate patient services and reimbursement opportunities. 
And so while we expect EHR technology to rapidly mature over the next two years, it's important to create an IT enablement plan that meets patient, family, and provider needs today. Got it. So um, you're, you're likely going to have to augment what you may already have in place today. Uh, Dr. Lilla, just to kind of build on sort of your operating experience as well, what does that potentially look like? I mean, what types of specific investments do you think make sense? So again, um, you know, for me, the most important thing was being able to have some visibility into what was happening with our patients when they were being cared for by providers outside of our scope, you know, services that we didn't own or operate on our own, and being able to have bi-directional communication uh, to intervene. Uh, you know, the worst thing that used to happen when I, especially on the hospital end, we would have this fabulous discharge plan and everything we thought was taken care of, and we'd send the patient off to that next level provider, and then something would fall apart, or there would be a question that that next level provider had, and they didn't have a way to reach back out to the appropriate person. They're calling nursing floors. The nurse is gone. That was on shift. You know, it's not the same hospitalist that discharged the patient. Really, a potential for disaster. So if, if you have a system where you are able to message back and forth in real time with mobile capabilities. So your staff doesn't have to be sitting there waiting at a desktop or a laptop to receive a message. It can be on their phone while they're on the go seeing patients. To me, that's ideal. And also having that platform being able to help you to identify high quality providers and, and those providers that are good stewards of care and those that are good partners as well that actually take your cases in a timely fashion, deliver the services that they say they're going to deliver and, and communicate back with you in terms of the outcome because you're responsible uh, depending on what type of program you're in, whether it's a 30-day delivery model or a BPCI, uh, you know, you, you need to have control over areas that you don't necessarily have direct control. So then you need visibility and communication. Communication is key um, electronically. Yeah, and, and just to build on that, obviously Dina has a role here in the industry. You know, part of our vision is to um, really to build on exactly what you outlined. One, how do we make it easier to organize your key partners, the one, many of which Tina, you mentioned earlier, and turn them into trusted care delivery partners outside of your four walls, everything from a licensed service like home health or physicians who are delivering house calls to actually partners like courier services. And so there's, there's quite a bit there to organize to create a nice branded experience. The second part, a lot of what we do is how do we allow them to work together and communicate in real time in a way as if they were all under the same roof and even on the same floor. Um, that's easier said than done, but I think technology has a big role there. And I think we all need to recognize that there are times when uh, we're not going to be in front of the patient or the family. And so the ability to sort of create that engaged proactive experience as well as the safety blanket of a virtual call nurse button so that we have the ability to be there just in time and bring resources to the table. Sometimes through virtual technology like remote patient monitoring and or telehealth, there's a lot of creative solutions. This is a lot of where Dina plays. I think mashing those two things together to help support hospital at home, SNF at home, chronic care management at home, there seems to be a lowest common denominator around these core capabilities. So. I appreciate all the comments um, here to date. I, as I reflect on our discussion so far, it seems like if we're gonna be successful around using an individual's living room as a, as a formalized care setting, clearly you need to have a vision for this. You need to have an organization that's really bought in at the executive level and all the way through the organization. Obviously a culture of innovation at this stage I think is critical. Hopefully as the market matures, this becomes more standard operating procedure. Um, and there's clearly a vision around the financial side of this story in a way that doesn't uh, damage or impact or impede the progress that organizations are trying to deliver on, on an annual basis. And you have partnerships. So um, at a high level, there's a lot that's involved here. You know, Cynthia, I want, I want to pull you back into the discussion here. Um, there has to be some sort of mechanism. Again, you've been doing this for a very long time to help an organization think through, how do we make sure we're ready for this? I mean, th these are the key sort of components, but I imagine if people have been doing this for a very long time, there's got to be some sort of guidepost or benchmark that can figure out this is what level one looks like and this is what advanced looks like. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about that EMR maturity model as a concept, but um, 
again, you've put a lot of thought and time into this. Yes, and we at HealthLink Advisors have created a maturity model that we like to use with our clients that really help them understand where are they. I'm a big proponent of uh, maturity models because you have to start with your structure. You have to really understand your organizational design. And being in healthcare, we are all, all of us are about how do we continuously improve the care that we deliver in a cost-effective manner. So we like to work with folks to, uh, certainly everyone wants to get to uh, the top of the pyramid, which is making sure that you've reduced readmissions and you have a reduction in the overall to total cost of care while providing a very satisfying experience to patients and families. So when you think stepwise in your progression, You've got to have the, the foundation, certainly. You've got to have some basic home care um, uh, services in place. You really need to understand as an organization, where are you on your care innovation vision? How do you identify from a use case perspective, which are the patients you really want to begin to, to target? Um, and putting together your basics protocols and your communication. And then as Marianne and others have spoke, there's a whole set of technology enablers that are gonna help support that communication. And then have you had a chance to have an opportunity to have those critical conversations with your payers? So really, you know, it's, it's, it's not bad to be, you know, at step one, two or three, it's just sort of like the HIMSS model or um, certainly a data governance maturity model, but it really helps you provide visibility to your leadership team and to your organization. Where do we want to get to? Where are we on that uh, level of maturity and what, you know, what's the pace that we, uh, that we want to move uh, to really provide this wonderful, innovative, high quality and very safe uh, delivery of care. And above all, we share this because we want all of you to be successful. That's our, that's our goal and that is our intention. Thank you. It, and th this, is a, this is a great framework and maturity model. I, I love the sort of, you know, the, really the simplicity. Of, I mean, this feels achievable when I see it laid out this way, but um, I know that Yatina, the entire HealthLink Advisors organization is really passionate about this. I want to give you an opportunity to sort of talk to our audience about, um, it's great that we have a framework. It's great that we know what the key areas may look like. Um, but I know that today that there's an opportunity for us to, to make this even easier for the audience to, to engage and solicit our help potentially in, in helping think through this. Yes, absolutely. You know, so many teams struggle with where to begin and, you know, how do you take the first steps forward to, to establish your hospital at home? How do you, and how do you grow and scale? And so we're excited to provide a complimentary rapid pace hospital at home readiness assessment that will evaluate all of the hospital at home elements your organization needs to address in comparison to the maturity model that Cynthia just reviewed. And so that's going to highlight the areas of opportunity and provide some initial guidance for you and your teams. Um, you know, ultimately we just genuinely want your organization to succeed in establishing your hospital at home program. Wonderful. So I, I know that at the end of this session, we're going to share our contact information again, and then obviously um, feel free to work with uh, the folks that matter to get in touch with us. But um, I think this would be a phenomenal opportunity for us to get to know one another and um, help organizations just make sure that they have a great roadmap on this journey. There's things are changing fairly rapidly. Um, there is a way to put a structured process and framework in place and then a mechanism to not go at it alone. Um, whether you decide to do this with your existing team and resources and partners and or engage others to really help support you, um, just, just know that you've got a, a good, uh, able, willing team here to, to engage with you. Um, I know that we're, we're approaching the time that we're going to kick off the Q&A. Um, before I do that, though, I, I just wanted to provide a, a few closing thoughts on uh, just today's discussion. There, there's an overwhelming amount of change in the industry, you know, prior to everything that was happening with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there was quite a bit of signals around the silver tsunami. And that was the, the rapidly aging population in the 65 plus bracket, age bracket, and the projected tax on the existing delivery system, both in terms of, do we have enough clinical capacity and do we have enough physical capacity to actually care for everyone? And although that was something that would generally have a lot of head nods and people understood that there was something very serious here that we need to get ahead of, um, 
I think COVID-19, unfortunately, gave us a picture of what it looks like when we don't have enough resources to deliver on high quality care, whether that be technology, staff, facilities. And so this is a really timely conversation. Um, you know, I just want to publicly acknowledge all of the partners within the industry that are doing their part to really deliver the very best care uh, on the patient and family's terms. And if that's in someone's living room, we should be there to help support them as long as we can do it safely. And I know that there have been conversations I've been a part of that sometimes the home is not a safe place to deliver a particular type of care. And that's okay. I think we have to think about the patient and family first and make sure that we've got the right tools and partners to really deliver on that care. So we're incredibly excited about this opportunity to play a, a, an important role in the industry. We're honored to partner with HealthLink Advisors because um, we are not uh, a professional advisory company. And I think between Dina and HealthLink Advisors, uh, we've got a good combination of technology and clinical and advisory services to help organizations think through this. It, it does feel like it's the early innings of this particular ball game, uh, to use a baseball analogy. So um, with that, uh, I do want to make a, a couple of additional comments before we open it up for Q&A. The first is there, there are some questions in the Q&A around this presentation and recording be, being made available. This is something that we'll work with the MATTER team to make sure that everyone has, a, uh, has access to uh, both the presentation as well as the, the video recording of the presentation. And there's also a follow-on question uh, in the Q&A that was submitted around just, there's a lot of uh, information that's sourced throughout the presentation and there's an interest to follow those sources and links. And so when we make that available, we'll make sure that the, all of those links are something that you can click on and it'll follow that. There are some sources that are PubMed in nature as, as somebody uh, acknowledged here, which you will need to have a registered uh, account to be able to get access to some of that. But if you reach out to us privately, um, we're also willing to, to help make that easier if you don't already have access to an account like that. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, jump into the, the Q&A here and uh, take a, a few of the questions here to live. Uh, haven't had a chance to really curate a lot of them, so I appreciate everyone's understanding as we tackle these things. But you know, one of the first questions was, um, it was about a specific market in the country, Southeastern Pennsylvania, but the question I think is relevant for everyone. How can, where can someone find out um, who in their specific market is actually providing hospital at home services or the specific providers, whether that's somebody who already does it today or has the intent and has the appropriate paperwork filed with Medicare to offer that. Um, maybe we could start with Dr. Loletta and then maybe Tina, you can also uh, build on that as well. Sure, you can go right on the CMS website and see who's been approved for the waivers. I have not been able to find who has applied for the waiver and not been approved, uh, but certainly the information is out there publicly available for which health systems and hospitals have been approved for the waiver and the dates of which they were approved for the waiver. So you can see who was earlier to the game versus more recently. Awesome. Yeah, I would, I would just add that that information is updated about every three weeks on average. So if you're interested in tracking, you know, the continued growth, it's definitely available online, like Marianne mentioned. Um, perhaps we just to make life a little bit easier as we share out the materials, we can we can insert that that link as a source on um, one of our slides and just make it easier for people to find that. Um, second question uh, here, and again, I'll I'll send this to both uh, both to Cynthia and Dr. Loletta, but um, there's a question here around you know, specifically why two visits per day in the hospital at home delivery model, especially if we've got 24 by seven monitoring and specialized apps like Skype or Zoom that can consult with a doctor. This is a really good question. There is a nuance here in those requirements and uh, Dr. Lillette, I'll let you start and Cynthia, maybe you can add on. Sure, so again, it is a requirement of the CMS acute hospital care at home waiver. And remember, these are patients that would have qualified for inpatient care if you didn't have hospital at home available. So they are sick patients uh, that need uh, you know, some touch. 
basically. And not all programs have 24 seven remote patient monitoring, right? So some are intermittent and they may be being applied by the patients. You may have an elderly patient that are trying to uh, connect a blood pressure device or check their sugars and send you that data. So it is important to have a clinician in-person visit to do the assessment and really uh, make sure that the current care plan is still appropriate for that patient or whether or not it needs to be changed, just like you would if they were in the hospital. Care plan changes day to day, medication list changes day to day. So I, I do think it's a critical critical piece for hospital at home in specific. And I agree, uh, Marianne. I think that it is part of the success of a hospital at home program. It's really high touch. It is, and we can, you cannot forget that again, these are patients who would normally have been in acute care setting. And so constant interaction is a key critical success factor. Yeah, and, and, and Tina, I just know in some of our discussions as well, we've talked about front loading, the high touch component to it. And then as the, the patient is on progressing appropriately against a care pathway, there is clearly an opportunity within the, the, the way the model is described to be able to leverage virtual care resources like telehealth visits and remote patient monitoring as well. Absolutely, yep. And there's, there's depending on how a team manages their staff model for those in-home visits, there's a varying level of the type of clinical care that you may send in front of the patient also based on the patient's needs as well. So it's going to vary by uh, what the patient needs are also. Yeah. So just building on that, that question, and maybe I can uh, keep you on the spot here, Tina. There, there's a question around um, just technology in general and which EHRs may provide some of this today. And, and then there's also a follow-on question uh, from a different uh, attendee around um, what does one actually need for the IT enablement step? And so maybe you can kind of provide a little bit of color on, on some of your comments around EMRs earlier in the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the, the big EHR companies right now are offering what we call to be uh, lightweight workflows for their existing clients. Um, these, these workflows take about two to three weeks on average for a health system team to configure and get through the build process. So there is some focused effort needed by an IT team to make that work in parallel um, to those clinical leaders that you may be partnering with on that. And that actually enables a few things. It does enable some remote documentation for those patient visits in the field. Um, but like we mentioned earlier, there are a lot of gaps um, based on the limited capabilities of those workflows. And those are the things that you're really going to want to focus on. So what do I mean by that? A good example is if you're in a state that has a certification process for a field paramedic team and you will be leveraging field paramedics for a portion of your inpatient visits of your hospital at home patient visits, um, there is a documentation requirement that you're going to need those field paramedics to be able to do real time. Um, in addition to connecting any virtual care um, from your clinical staff um, based back at the health system as needed to help support that patient. And so there are additional technology, integration, um, data and analytics that you're going to need to be thinking about and to plan for and able to ensure that you know, that one component is addressed. So each area, when we think about the staff model and capabilities of care that the program is providing has its own unique um, IT criteria as well. Got it. So th there is an opportunity to build on what already exist in the market, which I think, you know, nobody's looking here to implement a brand new system and replace everything here. I, I think the key here is to complement um, what already exists in the market. And so if an organization has a, an EMR that they're happy with, that's fantastic. Right. Um, that technology may not have, may or may not, and I think it's a part of the evaluation, may, may or may not have the ability to organize digitally all of the partners, home health, hospice, physician, but also courier services and the other things that we described. So that's, that's typically an area that may be something that we could fill in. And um, also an organization may have investments in remote patient monitoring and telehealth that are outside of their EMR. So again, technology that can help bring that together in a really simple and easy experience that fits the model for patients and families alike. Um, 
Marianne, I, I know that again, thinking of, thinking about your experience, um, you may have some thoughts here as well. Yeah, and I know you're very humble, Ashish, but I think that we really should talk a little bit about Dina, uh, Dina's platform and what it is uh, capable of right now. Um, where my excitement was in joining this company and honestly why I wanted to be a part of it, uh, because I, I think it is unique in that it does help connect to those disparate providers who may not even be on an EHR, um, maybe a meal delivery service, um, but you know it, it definitely helps to hone in on the high quality providers. Again, see which different um, uh, staff members are interacting with your patient, send referrals, receive referrals, uh, communicate bi-directionally. There are a lot of, and, and also involve the patient and or caregiver uh, potentially in the communications with uh, HIPAA compliant communication. So um, again, I know we don't have time to show it, but um, check out the website and see it. it's a very exciting product that layers on top of your already existing EHR. Uh, and again, I, I just feel the potential is there to really bring all of the different groups together and, and help you manage these patients and, and really keep a close eye on them. I appreciate you adding that. You know, I'm looking at the clock and I know that we've got a couple, you know, probably time for two more questions. And so while I do that, I'm going to flip up our contact information for the audience so that you know how to get a hold of us. All of our information is up here. Um, Tina, a question for both you and Cynthia here, just kind of coming back to the work that you're doing in the market. There's a really great question here, just based on your experience with clients that have successfully deployed or partially deployed hospital at home. Um, what would you say are the top elements that a hospital should make, uh, to, should really emphasize to ensure that they're prepared for their discussions with their managed care or payer partners, right? And so part of this is making sure that you're ready for that financial discussion as well around reimbursement, if I had to imagine. What are you seeing as the, the one to three key areas uh, of focus? I think, and Tina, chime in, keep me honest, I think it is certainly understanding what is the cost, are you going to make a cost or buy decision with your hospital at home program, and what is your payer planning to do in the marketplace, what we're seeing is that given kind of the, you know, the time frame with COVID, and the fact that uh, insurance insurer payers uh, did not pay for a lot of uh, what we would call regular care. There was a lot of time and effort spent on developing, you know, further, you know, expansion of care into other uh, other settings. So I think first of all, under you know, understanding what your managed care marketplace is like, where's your maturity in that, um, and then you know, do you want to make or buy that program, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, going from there. And Tina, do you have item number three? Yes, thank you. I think the, the last point I would add is that, you know, regardless of whether or not a health system chooses to build or buy uh, their hospital at home care services, it's really important that you have an outlined business plan that you're going to carry forward in those discussions with your payers to establish, you know, a new type of partnership with them um, with some new reimbursement models of care, because this is going to definitely modify your um, at-risk contract positions and being able to clearly communicate you know, what your plan is, types of populations that you're focused on, how you're going to grow and scale, what your goals are essentially and the outcomes, the way that you're monitoring those metrics to produce the results that you know you're going to see over time are all really important for those payers to understand up front and then to be able to get that data from you as well. At a very high level, I mean, what we're talking about with our quick assessment is, you know, helping to start those conversations with you. And I, I just want to reinforce that is something that's available to no cost to you. Well, I, I think we have time for one last question, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, this last one's a hard, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic question, and um, it will be hard to answer in a, in a minute or two here, but it is important enough to reference and perhaps it's, it sets the stage for a follow-up in terms of discussion, but it's how can health equity be incorporated into hospital at home models? Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that I'll, I'll take on just really in the interest of time, but um, I think there's an incredible opportunity, especially as all of these care at home models progress, not just hospital at home or SNP at home, to really think about alignment around value. And so if, if you are covered from a payment perspective, your ability to have flexibility to 
first of all, activate new sort of capabilities or services that may be non-medical in nature. In, in some cases in the Medicare Advantage world, we see pest control and transport and other sort of capabilities being brought into the mix. I think this is an incredibly important part of these models and the future direction. So when we think about partners that you need to deliver on care, this is the perfect place to think about health equity and making sure that it's not just a one size fits all, but the partners and resources that one type of person may need in a particular community may look radically different and that's okay. If you have the right infrastructure, the right process, the right delivery in place, you'll be able to better serve your community in organ as an organization um, if, you're, if you're making the right calls in this area. Like I said, likely a whole nother webinar conversation all, all uh, onto itself. But um, Dr. Lillette, I know that you came off uh, mute here for a moment. I'll give you the last word here before we wrap. Sure, I agree. Engaging community-based organizations, whether they are faith-based or support groups is key. And you may even consider having a social worker in your program or a health coach that can really relate to the patient on their level. Uh, health coaches, especially if they come from the community that you're serving, really can garner a lot of trust uh, from the patients and, and help them understand and, and navigate the care model on a more intimate level than, than maybe their care provider uh, could be able to do. Wonderful. Well, on behalf of uh... Tina and Cynthia and the HealthLink Advisors team, thank you again for this opportunity and Dr. Loletta for your wonderful comments throughout. And then uh, to Stephen and the entire Matter community and all of its members and partners, we really appreciate the opportunity to share this education over the last 60 minutes. And I hope you'll take us up on this offer to keep the conversation going and uh, look forward to partnering with all of you as we work to really enable this shift to, to healthcare at home. So thanks again for all of your time.